Kaifiyat wa ghusl. How do we perform this ghusl? Al khutuwat, the following steps. So these are the steps to taking a ghusl, inshallah. Wa yabda'u, a person should always start his ghusl and start everything. This is everything. Right time, start everything. Al mukhtasilu, the person who's taking the ghusl, he should start with tasmiya, say the name of Allah. Say Bismillah. Say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Say Allah. Say, mention some dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get the blessings of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever you are about to do. Right? So like you take, say Bismillah when you do wudu, you say Bismillah when you do ghusl, you say Bismillah when you eat, you say Bismillah when you're going to enter your house, open the door, close the doors, open the windows, close the windows, you say Bismillah all the time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to be of those people who can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance. May Allah make us Allah majalla min az zakirin Allah kathiran wa zakirat for those who remember Allah of the males and females in abundance. Not just now and again, not just when we reminded, but in abundance inshallah. All the time, 24 7, somehow or the other, our hearts and minds are always connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to say tasmiya at the beginning of your husul, bismillah. Right? Then, thumma, bi izalat al qadr. Or right? And then to remove any types of dirt. So there's physical dirt that might be on you. Right? You have hay coming out of your state of your menses. There's a little bit of blood. You need to clean yourself off. Almost like you're making a steam jet, cleaning yourself up. There's stool that came what was on you, urine, vomit, blood, etc. Whatever is dirty, you're trying to clean that off you before you're gonna do yours. The reason is you don't want these things to fall in your if you're using the old bucket system. You don't want a little bit of blood to fall in your little bit of water and therefore spoil your water. Right? So you first want to clean all the physical dirts away and then you just, in terms of chukman, meaning in ruling you dirty, but you're not physically dirty anymore. The physical dirt is gone. It's out of the way. So now you can start throwing the water. Right? Then they say, after you've removed the dirt, after you've maybe made your in and so on as well, thumma wudu, then make a wudu. What type of wudu? Wudu has a couple of meanings. All the meanings of wudu is just to wash your hands. Right? It's just to wash your hands. But this is why they mention here, ka wudu is salah. This is not the wudu of washing your hands. This is the wudu of the full wudu. So before you're going to take your ghusl, it is actually sunnah to actually take a full sunnah wudu. Put yourself in a state of wudu before you're going to take even your ghusl of janara. Right? You're going to take your money. Right? You're going to take your ghusl of, after your hayd, your nifas. You take a wudu before that. It's not necessary, but this is the whole sunnah procedure that trying to tell us. Right? So you start washing your hands, you rinse the mouth, the nose, wash the whole face, etc. Everything we went through in wudu, you do a complete wudu. Right? And then you're going to go on to the next step, inshallah. Right? And then we're going to go on to the actual ghusl now um, in the shower that you are busy with. Just a thing also, the hadith, the Prophet says that. Um, there's a hadith. Barakatu ta'am, the blessings of food, al wudu qablahu wa al wudu ba'da. The blessings of food is to make wudu before you eat and to make wudu after you eat. So, what does that mean? That's the other wudu. Imagine you must go take a full wudu before you eat. And after you eat, you must take another full wudu. That's not the wudu of salah. In there, the meaning of wudu comes that it means to wash your hands. The blessings of food is in washing your hands before you eat. And is washing your hands after you eat as well. Right? So, inshallah, let us implement some of the sunnahs of the Prophet. Alayhi salatu was salam. There is so much blessings in the Sunnah of the Prophet Without Sunnah, there would be a very different thing we'd be looking at if we tried to take away Sunnah from the Quran. Summa, now a person, then you feed him, he will pour al the water. We have the water poured for us. We're very fortunate, Alhamdulillah, we have showers, we have taps, we have these type of mechanisms around us. Some people are blasting from all sides nowadays. You understand? They have these showers that, you know, cover them 360 degrees, right? SubhanAllah. All different types of favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors different types of people with, right? But let's say we're using the old school method and we are using a jug, right? So there's your, your big um, bucket of water. You're taking a jug and you are away from your shower area over here. The jug is over there. You're scooping it. You're throwing the water. ثُمَّ يُفِيدُ الْمَا عَلَىٰ رَأْسِهِ We first throw the water over the head, right from the top. So that that water can sink in, goes over your face and it starts running down and it's cleaning. And remember that water it doesn't just clean your head. The water is cleaning as long as it's on your body. So that water you threw on your head, as it runs down your body, till, if it runs right down to your toe, it's clean that whole section. Right? It's not, it doesn't just clean the first area it touches. It cleans as, it, as long as it's on your body. It's busy cleaning. That's why you can use two to three liters of water in a sunnah amount of ghusl. Right? For a complete ghusl. Because that water keeps cleaning while it's on you. And that's why you can rub that water around for it to reach further areas and guide that water so that it washes more of your body. You understand? So, the person throws the water over his head. Salatan, three times. Three jugs go over the head. But it's obviously, like I said, it's not only cleaning your head. It's cleaning more than just your head. Right? But there will be areas of your body that obviously that three jugs of water is not going to cover. Therefore, you continue after you've thrown the three jugs of water on your head. Also, not to forget, Nawiyah was an intention. Like what is your intention when you're throwing the water the first time and the water touches your head? Raf al Janaba, that I'm removing my state that I'm in. Whatever my state is, I'm in my major state, sexual, uh, um, um, sexual state that I'm in, this um, uh, impure state that I'm in, or I'm coming out of hate or nifas. I'm removing the state. That's my intention. I will hide or istibah at salah, or I'm seeking permission to make prayer through taking this ghusl. You're throwing the water with that type of intention. Why you khallilu, and the person will dig his fingers into his head, trying to make the water reach the scalp. Right? They're trying to make the water, sha'arahu, make it reach the scalp. As the water is being poured, he's trying to make, move the water around so the water reaches his whole scalp, reaches all the roots of the hair, and all the hair gets wet. Thumma, after he's done now with the hair, the hair is done complete. Obviously, that water is also washed part of his body as it trickled down. Thumma, ala shikkihi al ayman, thalatha, now he throws over his right side. On his right shoulder, he's going to throw the water three times. So that the right side of the body now you'll move that water around and you'll try and cover his right side. So similarly, if anyone ever partaken um, in a janaza and you see how they wash the person on the cartel, it's basically the same procedure. The way you wash yourself that they're explaining here is the exact procedure that we use for the person because he can't wash himself. So we are doing the washing for him, right? The Hasid is washing him, um, the Tukamani is washing him with some assistance from some people, turning the body on different sides, etc., so that we can reach different areas and we can cover the back and the front at the same time. But basically, this is the ghusl we're doing for the maid as well. The same ghusl we're going to do for ourselves. So now we're throwing water on, on the right side three times, a jug on the shoulder on the right side, and we're trying to cover that area and move that water around so that the whole right side, back and front, gets covered. Then we move over to the left side, right? If it's, a, if it's a maid, obviously we turn him on his right side, then we can cover the, the, the front and the back of his left side, and we throw the water down from his shoulder all the way down to his leg, and we cover his, his left side, thalathan, also three times, obviously here you're doing it for yourself. We're fortunate the shower is throwing the water on us all the time. All we have to do is Make intention that I'm, I'm doing my right side, make intention that I'm doing my left side, but in reality, it's doing it all at once for you. And the fact of the matter is, if you just stood under your shower with an intention and your whole body got wet after that intention, ghusl would have been done. Ghusl is done already. Right? But this is like more old school style, and we can still make those intentions and in our imagination, you know, we can still picture this is happening under the shower as well. Then a person, وَيَتَأَحَدُ He must take special care. مَعَاتِفَهُ Of the folds that a person has. Nowadays, Alhamdulillah, everyone has a lot of folds because it is a Qiyamah. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, unfortunately, 
obesity will be common. Right? I think uh, in America, probably every second person, if not more, is probably obese. It's probably got too much weight on themselves, right? We need to make sure we get under those love handles, in those grooves, in those crevices, right? In the navel, you understand? We need to make sure the water reaches all these little areas that are difficult to reach sometimes if we're not going to make the water go in there. Right? It's not just going to put the water flowing down. Sometimes we need to make it go up, right? Because we need to move some folds, we need to move around, and Allah knows best. So take care of those areas. وَيُدَلِّكُ And a person should also rub جَسَدَهُ Because you're rubbing the water. Right? You're rubbing the water all over, so like you're scrubbing down your body. You're rubbing the water all over to make sure that every area of your body gets reached. Every hair must be wet from root to tip. And every part of your skin must be wet. Must be wet. There must be nothing preventing the water from reaching your body. All your nails must be wet also. Right? The outside of your nails. Your nails, your toenails, your fingernails and so on. Right? You have nail polish on, that's waterproof. It's not reaching your nail. Your husr is not accepted, your wudu is not accepted. Different to khina. Khina is a, a, an ink. Right? And ink actually goes into the pores of whatever you put it on. Right? Ink is what they call, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Porous. Ink is porous, so it will go in and it will sink into something. Right? And therefore, you will still reach the surface of that thing when you're putting the water on top of it. Different to paint. Nail polish is nail paint. Paint is on the surface. It protects it from water. That's why we paint our homes. We paint our cars so that the, the water can't reach the metal and cause, cause the metal to rust. We paint our homes so that our walls are not constantly damp. You understand? Because the paint is a shell that is causing the water not to come through. It's preventing the water from coming through. So make sure you don't have anything that's water highly water resistant and highly waterproof that's on your body, on your nails, on your on your skin, etc. Um, that's going to prevent painters need to be very careful they're painting all the sprinkles all over their faces and now they want to take a whistle that is preventing paint from re I mean water from reaching your skin your wudu will not be correct if it's on the limbs of wudu and if it's on your body, then your hustle won't be correct if you need to make a hustle in that particular condition. Right? So we need to be extra careful if we find ourselves in these type of professions where we're dealing with uh, chemicals or material that could serve as a barrier between our skin and the water. Then, if a, if a lady has hide, she should follow up the hide if her hide is finished, but now there might be a smell or whatever the case may be or there's a traces of blood so she should tut bihu atharat dam the traces of the blood should be followed up with firsata misk with a firsa with woolen with cotton wool that is dabbed in some fragrance preferably musk and she places it there like a pad between her private parts in order to um, you know give it a different fragrance right to remove the ather of the, the blood um, you can obviously just use water, but this is extra and above that. Extra and above that, you, you, you're putting the musk smell over there as well, and Allah subhanahu wa knows best. In the book I was just reading earlier, they said, if you don't have musk, you don't have some fragrance to place there on the cotton wool, they even say then use any type of tea, right? So any type of fragrance to maybe take away, maybe there's a slight smell, you know, of blood or whatever the case may be, trying to try to remove that smell. They even mention teen, meaning even if you have to take mud, some soil, that will, because it's a very good cleaner soil, that's why we use it in Tayamo, right? And we use it in, uh, when we're cleaning with the dog, then we use a mud pack, you understand? So even if you have to use some wet soil and rub it there, it's obviously very coarse. That will help to take any traces of the blood also away. And then they say the last is wakafal mal, but water is obviously sufficient. Water will suffice for washing you. Nowadays we have soap. We have, uh, um, um, what is this, shower gels. We have so much things, so much things, technology that can help us obviously remove these smells. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then, wajibat al -husl. What are the arkans, the rukuns, the fara'id, the necessary things of a husl? 
Your two things which are necessary in the ghusl, that is it. Al-wajib minhu shay'an. There are only two things you need to get a complete ghusl. Two things and then you have a ghusl. And niyya. Number one is you must have an intention. In the awwali ghusli makhroodin, the first time you wash anything of your body, because our body is far to wash in the ghusl. So you can start with your feet. When you're washing your feet and you're starting the ghusl, and you're making an intention that I'm busy with my father ghusl, the, the niyat is there and you start to do ghusl. If you're starting by your head, which is obviously the typical way to do it, and the water touches your head and you make the niyat that I'm busy with my father ghusl, that will suffice you, the niyat has happened. Right? Doesn't matter where the water goes, if your niyat starts there, the ghusl has started. Right? The niyat must be there. Then number two, you must encompass all the hair. All the hair from tip, root to tip, must be wet. وَبَشَرِهِ And all the skin must be wet. Bilma, it must be covered with the water, the tahur, the, the purificatory water that you're using, the water coming out of your taps. Hatta, even so much so. This is the extent of where the water must reach. Remember we were speaking about folds. تَحْتَ كُلْفَةٍ Under the kulfa. What is a kulfa? A kulfa is a, so the, the skin, what we call the foreskin. The foreskin. For a person who still, you look confused, Hazrat. For the person who still has a foreskin. It must give Islam fatakhal embrace. Dr. Jakut Basi Fadakhi. You understand? Um, he's, he's made an appointment for his, for his, for his sunnah. You understand? So he's still got the foreskin, but he's a Muslim. Now he's taking a ghusl. You understand? It's mustahab to take a ghusl. Or he was with his, he got married and he was with his wife. He still has that appointment for that sunnah to happen. Now he's got a foreskin. What must he do? He must make sure that he pulls the foreskin down and make sure that the water gets around that area where the foreskin is covering and it must get in there. Right? So he has to make sure, because that part of the skin, all the skin, all the folds need to be reached. غير المخدون, a person who is not circumcised. وما يظهر, and then that which is apparent or becomes apparent من فرج الثيب from the private parts, the vagina area of a lady, a married woman, or let's say a woman, maybe she's not married, but she has had some sexual experience. She was married, she's divorced now. Right? So a thayib, meaning a non virgin. A non-virgin, uh, private parts is different to that of a virgin. A non-virgin's private parts opens up quicker. Right? Because she's had sexual experience. Right? So, a virgin, everything's like, let's call it, it's tighter. Right? If she does certain actions, um, a vagina doesn't move in the way that a married woman or a person who has sexual experience moves. So now this is why they're specifically mentioning this particular type of lady here. وَمَا يَدْهَرُ That which becomes apparent مِنْ فَرْجِ الثَّيِّبِ From the private parts of a lady who has sexual experience, a non-virgin إِذَا قَعَدَتْ When she sits, meaning when she squats There's a term missing, I think, there لِحَاجَتِهَا To relieve herself So if a lady who has sexual experience goes into a squatting position Right, goes into a squatting position. Goes into a squatting position. So what happens is certain things are going to open up in this position now. Because she's squatting. Right? The vagina, the lips, the labia majora, the major lips are going to part. A certain part of the vagina is going to come exposed. So they're saying that when she washes herself, and this goes for every lady that needs to wash herself, she needs to wash that area that would become exposed if she was sitting in this position. So let's say she's taking the whistle standing up. So the vagina and the lips are closed. Right? But she must, when she rubs down there with a cloth or with her hand to make the water go in, that's one of the grooves she needs to get in because the water needs to get in by that lips on the inside. Right? Because if she squatted, it would have opened up. And then it would have been visible. And that area, that is an area that also needs to be washed. We're not saying that she needs to wash inside her vagina. We're saying it's the outside, basically, of the vagina, which the major lips, the labia majora, cover. Everyone with us? 
Then, um, the Hanafi. The Hanafis have a few extras in terms of the wajibat of the ghusl, and we can also apply this. And normally, you are going to apply this if you're going to make wudu anyway. وفي المذهب الحنفي يجب المدمضة هو الحنفي it's necessary to rinse the mouth in ghusl also they must rinse the mouth to hold out the mouth is a must in the ghusl while it's in shab and to take water out the nose and blow it out is also a must for Hanafis if Hanafis don't do that two things they are leaving out wajib things in the ghusl ghusl is not valid they must blow out the nose, rinse the mouth it's part of the ghusl Right? With the whole body being wet. So Hanafis have three arkans. Um, niya for them, I think, is a sunnah. Right? The niya is a sunnah. But the three arkans for them, or the three wajibat, is you must wet the whole body, just like the shafis. But then you must also rinse the mouth, and you must also clean out the nose. Those are the three things for Hanafis. For us, it's the niya with the whole body being wet. If you achieve a niya with your whole body being wet, Ghusl is done. These are all the extra measures that the wudu before the time, the cleaning, all those. Those are the extra mustahab, recommended, masnoon um, things to do, right? To get extra reward and get the best out of your ghusl. And Allah knows best. But let's say you're in a hurry and you need to get your ghusl done quickly. You jumped under the shower, the minute the water starts eating your body, you made a niyat of fad ghusl to clean yourself, to prepare for salah. You wet the whole body, you jumped out, dried yourself, put your clothes on. Um, you, you have a ghusl, right? You have been purified, and Allah knows best. Um, so for them, lisihat in a ghusl, this is for the validity of a ghusl, the Hanafis have that particular thing that they need to add there um, in, in the ghusl, and Allah knows best. So what we can do is, let's say for instance, if you're not taking the full sunnah wudu and, and everything before the time, all you can do is while you're in the shower, how difficult is it for you just to open your mouth while the water is falling from the shower? Open your mouth, rinse it out, spit, and just take a little water in your nose and blow it out. And then you have gotten out of the khilaf with the Hanafis. So you have a complete ghusl by the Shafis, and you also have a complete ghusl even by the Hanafis. Right? You must always look after our Hanafis brothers as well. Inshallah. He's not actually a Hanafi yet. We just joke with him. It's a personal joke. One of our, 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 our students, one of the graduates of the Arnaim. Mashallah. Um, continuing, inshallah. Have okay, any questions so far? Well, you know, what happens in the event where you have a wound or you have a dressing after operation or something like that? For Shafi's, uh, the, when you have wounds and stuff, which is a chapter which we are going to do, um, the, they make things a little bit difficult because. When you have wounds and a certain parts that need to be cleaned, like I'm just talking about even in wudu, then um, tayamum comes into play. Um, and normally, even in this particular book, Sheikh Nuh has also added it, they will mention the Hanafi um, a viewpoint as like a, like a bit of a compensation or a dispensation, right? Um, because it's a much easier view to follow once you, when you have wounds. And also in the Hanafi mother, you won't have to repeat prayers. We're in the Hanafi, in the Shafi mother, even though we're making it more difficult to cleanse yourself in the first place by having to wash and, and take the yamum, and sometimes you have to take the yamum a couple of times because of where the, wound, where the wounds are, etc. And then sometimes we're still going to say, you're still going to have to repeat your salahs after that as well, and so on and so on and so on, when we come to that particular chapter. Whereas the Hanafis um, uh, just say that if a person has wounds and the person is busy taking a ghusl and he can't wash the wound because the doctor said he can't open the bandage, then all he has to do is basically wash what he can wash of his body and then take a moist hand and wipe off of the bandage or wipe over the whole bandage just with a moist hand. And that will suffice him and that ghusl will be valid. And when he makes wudu, his wudu will be valid, and his salah will also be valid, and there will be no repeats of the prayer. So the mother in this particular thing is the easiest. And that's why all the say, ikhtilaf al-imma wa ikhtilaf al-umma rahma. You know, the difference of opinion between our great scholars, and the difference of the opinion of the umma, obviously the, 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 the khilaf is between the scholars, not between us ordinary people, right? 
is a rahma for the ummah. It's a dispensation for us. You know, it gives us more latitude when we see these, these great ulama having differences, but it makes things easier for people at the end of the day. Right? So that is the, normally, we'll, we'll teach the Shafi view, but most people realize it's very strict. When you find yourself in that situation, it's your prerogative as to what, which trade you're going to follow. Right? But the Hanafis seem to be the easiest on those type of messiah. Right? Especially when the wounds and so on come into play, the masala is very easy and Allah knows best. Right? Any other questions? Any other questions? No questions so far? Jim? Uh, so, that is the <coughs> same um, situation between the past and the past. Same, so um, that, that, that's the same chapter. So whether the wound has a band on it or not, and the doctor said you still can't wash it, it doesn't have a band that needs to stay open because it needs to dry, etc. If you're going to get water on it, it's going to fester, it's going to take longer to heal, it's going to be painful if you put water on it. Right? So the Shafis have a certain way of dealing with those type of wounds. The Hanafis always deal with it in the same way. Right? And like I said, their masala is just easier. So whether you have an open wound, or whether you have a closed wound, like a bandage, or whether it's a cast, you understand? Then in the Khan Shaf, Shafi Madam, we deal with it in a certain way. Sometimes the Yamun has to come into play as well. And sometimes on top of all of that, when you are healed up, you will still have to repeat all those prayers in certain cases. Right? Whereas the Hanafi, um, you won't have to repeat prayers. The way you're going to um, prepare yourself to pray, the way you're going to take Hussle, the way you're going to take Wudu, and the way you're just going to wipe over the bandage is going to suffice you. Your prayers are going to be valid and there will be no repeat prayers. Right? So that in a nutshell is obviously the easiest. We'll deal with the, with the Shafi when we come to that particular chapter. You'll see that there's a lot of difficulty in, in it. Those who can stay true to the mother, you know, should try, try and stay as far as possible true to the mother. But when you find yourself in a hospital, are you going to get out of the bed with a broken leg and you need to go make the yam? You're going to ask the nurse to go get clean soil for you, so that you can strike the soil and so on and so on. You know what I'm saying? So, in certain instances, it's going to become too difficult for you, and therefore, we mention these other views, especially when they are easier views, so that a person can use the facility of the views of the ulama to make your life easy in certain instances. Yeah. Right? And Allah knows best. Now. Just extension of that. Okay. So, just an example of the example. You say, uh, Fajr, um, if you had to take a, a, a buzzle and you were bandaged, right? And you then to use for yourself. When it comes to the actual salah, do you then uh, go back to uh, a shafi or? Yes, you still continue everything else as a shafi. It's just on this particular mas'ala, you're going to follow the Hanafis in this particular instance. There are ulama who discuss um, a, 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 they discuss a, um, a concept in deen which is called talfiq, that whether you cross the bound and now according to that mother they don't consider you having wudu or ghusl and according to that mother they also don't consider you having wudu or ghusl and now there's a clash, do you understand? Um, so some ulama say that if you're going to follow the Hanafis on a particular issue, let's say it's in ghusl or something then follow them in all the issues with regards to their ghusl, right? Or you're going to follow them on wudu, then follow them with all the issues with regards to their wudu, meaning whatever will also break their wudu, then consider that as well and so on. But I, I personally asked Munatah Karan Rahimullah regarding this particular issue um, with, this, with this concept called Tawfiq, and then he told me now a person can follow the individual issue, and that does not affect the way you make wudu or what breaks your wudu, etc., etc., and Allah knows this. Right? Allah knows this. Now, continuing, Naqtul Wudu Fi Atnayn Ghusl. So, breaking your Wudu during the Ghusl. So, remember, if you went through the Ghusl in the typical Sunnah way, you said Bismillah, you removed all the dirt. Now, you started making a normal Wudu for Salah, and now you're going to start taking your Ghusl. So, while you're taking your Ghusl, something happens during the Ghusl because you took a Wudu. That Wudu is valid, but it's suspended until the Ghusl is done. Once the ghusl is done, you have wudu because you took a wudu as well, right? So that wudu can now be used because you remove the major state of ritual impurity you in. But let's say during that ghusl, 
to touch your private parts which in the Shafi mother breaks your wudu. That wudu which you made in the beginning would now be broken. You've cancelled it. You've cancelled it. That means you will still be clean at the end of the ghusl because you've cleaned yourself you're out of the major state of ritual impurity. But you still have the minor state of ritual impurity, meaning that you would still need to make another wudu before you can make salah, read Quran, touch Quran, carry Quran, etc., uh, make tawaf, and so on. Right? Another thing to mention, which the book is not mentioning, is that if a person just makes a fad ghusl, and he doesn't touch his private parts or touch his wife during the ghusl or um, uh, break a wind during the ghusl, etc. He doesn't do any of the things which are going to break his wudu. Right? And he doesn't make a wudu in the beginning, the sunnah, sunnah um, wudu in the beginning. Because he's busy with a major state of ritual impurity, that carries within itself a minor um, uh, ablution. Right? So you actually get a wudu with a fad ghusl. You actually get a wudu with a fad ghusl. If you just took ghusl and you didn't do anything to break your wudu during that ghusl, you would walk out of that shower being able to pray immediately. Different to a sunnah ghusl. A sunnah ghusl doesn't carry this because this is the highest form of purification, the fad ghusl. The Fad Ghusl carries a built-in wudu into it. Unless you break that wudu during the Ghusl, or if you made even the Sunnah Ghusl before it, and you break it during, then you obviously have to make another wudu to continue any ibadat after the Ghusl is done. No one knows this. So they say, Walaw ahtatha, if a person breaks his wudu, fi athna'ihi, during his Ghusl, um, I think that should be atamahu, then he should just complete it. Complete the Ghusl, and also he can just complete another wudu to get himself into the state of wudu, right? But he is in a pure state in general, right? He's out of the state of Janaba, she's out of the state of Khayr, out of the state of Nifas, and so on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Any questions? Can you say that Yes, just jump in the shower with an intention and shower that your whole body, the water covers your whole body. You, you, can, you can immediately walk out of the shower, dry yourself off, clothe yourself, and you can pray. So now the wudu would be the bonus. The wudu, wudu, was, that's a bonus, yeah. That's not a bonus. That's a, that's a freebie. A freebie. A freebie, a freebie, but remember, it's only the freebie of a fart Yeah. It's not a freebie of your Jumu'ah no, 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 no. Jumu'ah is a Sunnah husl. It's not your freebie of your Ikhram husl. It's not your freebie of your entering Makkah Hussle or entering Madina Hussle. It's not a it's oh, not your freebie of your Eid Hussle. It's only a freebie of a Fart Hussle. But still the Sunnah is to make a wudu before the Fart Hussle. That's still the Sunnah. Right? That's the proper tartib to do. Even though the ulama say that this major uh, way of purification does carry a wudu within it and Allah knows best. We have asked our our elders regarding this, and this is what they've explained to us. Then, izalatun najasati qabla al ghusl Removing any najasa before you take a ghusl. Wa man alayhi najasatun, whoever has any dirt on him. Yaghsilun najasata, you should wash off the najasa first before they jump in the shower. Or first take like a pre-wash in the shower, let that najasa run down the drain. And then you start doing your ghusl activities. Thumma yaghtasilu, then take your ghusl. Wa yakfi laha ghuslatan. But it is sufficient only one ghusl. Ghuslatun. Only one wash is sufficient. Let's say for instance, I have some urine that's splattered onto my leg. I need to take a ghusl. Do I need to wash this off first? I don't actually. If I'm jumping in a shower where the water is running away. Right? And I just shower and the water goes with a near the ghusl. And it also runs down my leg over that area which was soiled with urine and washes all that down and it goes down the drain. That one wash has cleaned me, cleaned the urine, cleaned everything it's gone. Even though it's recommended, first clean the najasa, like we said in the first steps. First clean the najasa away, then take your ghusl. This is also to make sure that for people who are not using modern day showers where the water is running away in this fashion, but using a bucket system. Let's say for instance this urine splatters, falls into my small bucket. This could spoil my water. 
You understand? They're thrown into a shower where the waters now, tons of water are coming out of the shower and they're all flowing away in one direction. So everything which is flowing is becoming clean. You understand? But if this urine fell in my small bucket of water, which I'm trying to scoop out of, it might just soil my water. I might have a small piece of stool here, and now as I'm throwing, the other stool shoots off me and shoots into my bucket. I see the stool in that water. Is that water still clean? That water's nudges. That water's just been rendered useless. You understand? That's what I say, first clean of the Najasa, because obviously the book is written six, seven hundred years ago. They're talking about those situations. They never had showers that we have today. You understand? They never had these drainage systems that we have today. Sometimes a Prophet would be standing in a puddle of water at the end of his ghusl. And that's why he used to save the washing of his feet for lost. So he used to take wudu and he never used to wash his feet, Then he would take the whole ghusl because he's standing in that water, the water's not running away, they don't have the same systems like us. Then he would step away from that water and he would wash his feet separately away from that water, you understand? And now the hustle would be complete, right? So, but nowadays we have obviously showers, tiles, and so on, and everything, you've got a good tile and the water's running away. If it was a bad tile and the water's still standing over there. You understand? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. If the Najasa, you have to wash it as, as much as it is required. If the Najasa is still sticking there and you must wash, 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 you need to, it needs to disappear. You understand? The Najasa must leave you. But let's say it's just like urine or it's liquid, it's just going to wash away. But let's say it's some sticky um, blood or something in it, you know? Then you have to make enough effort on it so that it loosens up and then when the water flows over, it goes with the water, then it's clean. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then, غُسْلٌ وَاخِلٌ One wash, one ghusl. Right? Or غُسْلٌ وَاخِلٌ يَكْفِي لِسَبَبَيْن will suffice you for two reasons and even more two reasons. More than two reasons. Meaning, that sometimes you can take one ghusl, but the ghusl can serve you for many purposes. Right? We give an example. وَلَوْ كَانَ عَلَيْهَا غُسْلُ جَنَابَةٍ If there is upon her, meaning the lady, right? Um, a ghusl of Janaba. She was with her husband last night, so she needs to take a ghusl for Janaba. She's in a state of major ritual sexual impurity. But also, and upon her is also a ghusl but she also has the ghusl of haid upon her. Right? Um, because maybe she had intercourse with her husband on the one night, right? And then just before she wanted to take a ghusl of Janaba, then she got a haid. So now she can't take a ghusl to really purify herself. She'll just take a, a mundane shower to clean herself physically, pad herself up, she's in a khayd now. But at the end of her um, khayd, she, will make an, she can make an intention with one ghusl to remove that state of janaba when I was with my husband that night, and to remove my state of khayd because my seven days are over, and that one ghusl will suffice for both reasons. Right? So, فَاخْتَسَلَتْ um, She will take a ghusl لِأَحَدِهِمَا Even if she takes the ghusl for one, because both are fart. Even if she only takes the ghusl for the haid, or she takes a ghusl for the janaba, because both are fart, it will still remove both. It will serve for both. كَفَا anhuma It will serve and suffice for both ghusls which were required. Right? She actually only needs one fart ghusl. It will remove both reasons. وَمَنْ اِخْتَسَلَ And whoever takes a ghusl مَرَّةً وَاحِدَةً one time بِنِيَّةِ with the niyya of janabatin a male Thursday nights right which is Friday nights Laylatul Jumu'ah is with his wife tomorrow's Jumu'ah the morning he wakes up Fajr time right he needs to take a ghusl of janaba, but it's Jumu'ah also but then what Jumu'atin but then he says you know what I'm going to make niyat with this one ghusl of janaba now after Fajr right because I'm preparing to make my fajr on Friday morning. I'm going to make a niyat of my janaba, I was with my wife last night, but I'm also going to make a sunnah niyat of jumuah. This is my jumuah ghusl as well. Right? Hasala, both are achieved, if you make the niyat for both. So therefore you can make multiple intentions with one ghusl. And you can mix, as you can see, you can mix two farts or three farts. You can even mix a fart janaba and you can mix a sunnah also. Let's say, for instance, you were in the state of Janaba in Makkah. And it happened to also be Friday. You know what I'm saying? Uh, or you were entering Makkah. 
You understand? So you're going to take a ghusl for your janaba, you're going to take a ghusl for it's Friday's Juma, and you're going to take a ghusl for I'm entering Makkah also, because that's also a Sunnah ghusl. So you can make all three intentions, one ghusl, and you will achieve all of them through the one ghusl, but through the multiple intentions, inshallah. But what if you only make intention for one of them? Hasala will be achieved one, dun al akhir without the other. Let's say, for instance, I was with my wife last night. Right? It's Jumu'ah morning as well. But I may only make a need when I'm doing my ghusl for Janaba. Now, when I'm finished, now I realize, hey, Jumu'ah should. I can't now add this onto my intention, my ghusl is done. I've only achieved my Janaba ghusl. So I'm clean state now. If I want my Jumu'ah ghusl and the reward of a Jumu'ah ghusl also, I will have to take a separate Jumu'ah ghusl. Or let's say, for instance, I only took the Jumu'ah ghusl, which is a Sunnah ghusl. The Sunnah ghusl is never going to suffice me for the fault. I'm still in the state of Janaba. I will still have to take that ghusl of Janaba. You understand? So then it will be two ghusls that will need it to be done. Because I only made need for one. Therefore, a person needs to slow down a little bit sometimes we're very hasty when we're doing things and then because when you slow down and you become a bit what they call a more deliberate the prophet said deliberateness to deliberate something you know you you're thinking about it better you're pondering about it what should i do the thing is haste is a quality of the shaitan and deliberation the prophet said is a quality of a mukmi he, he takes things in his stride thinks about it thinks through first what should i do now yes I, I need Janaba. It's Friday also. I happen to be entering Makkah also. It happens to be that oh, I can actually achieve much more. He's taking his time thinking things through and then he's doing things. Al Ajila to Mina Shaitan, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam. Right? Haist is from Shaitan. Right? And to have this delib- deliberation and to take your time in things and, and to think things through, this is a quality of a believer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this quality as it comes in the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So we'll end inshallah on the, on the next um, couple of things. Al-awqatu allati yusannu fi ghuslun. The times in which it is considered as a sunnah to take a ghusl. These are sunnah ghusl in other words. Wa yusannu ghuslu ghuslun. And it is sunnah to make a ghusl fil jumuati on the day of Jumu'ah. When does your Juma ghusl start? Though many people start making their preparations from Thursday night. Yes, Thursday night is Laylatul Jumu'ah. It is Laylatul Jumu'ah. But the ghusl of Jumu'ah only starts after Fajr. The, the, the official Jumu'ah ghusl, if you want to take the Sunnah of Jumu'ah ghusl, it actually only starts from Fajr. And then you can take your ghusl anytime from that time onwards. Right? If it's Eid day though, E day's ghusl is different. E day you can take from the midnight of the night before. So that you can take Eid ghusl after the midnight is reached, whatever time it is, when the sun rises and when Fajr, that's the half of the night you determine. When the half of the night is reached, right? Then you can already take your Eid ghusl for the next day. But Jumu'ah's ghusl can only happen once Fajr sets in. Then you can take your official Jumu'ah ghusl. Not the Thursday night. That's not going to count as your Jumu'ah ghusl and Allah knows best. Then while Eidain and the two Eids, and there they mention that happens from the middle of the night. From the middle of the night, you can already take your Eid ghusl different to Jumu'ah. While Kusufayn and the two eclipses, there are only two eclipses, Sol and Luna eclipses. If any eclipses are happening, you can take ghusl for those eclipses also before you go out for that particular prayer. You can take a ghusl for it because it's a Jamaat prayer, right? So you can go out. And inshallah, um, that's also Sunnah Ghusl. What is this call? When you're going out Jamaat pray to do the istisqa to seek rain, right? Because we're in drought and so on, or we're seeking rain even for some other place, then we also can take a ghusl for that. That's also Sunnah. Waman Ghusl al Mayyid. And whoever is a Tukamani, if you are Tukamani, it is always Sunnah for you to take a ghusl after you have ghusled someone else. You've ghusled some person, it is a Sunnah ghusl for you afterwards. To, to hustle yourself off, right? When you go back home and so on, Janaz is finished, to take a hustle because you have partaken in that, um, in that person's um, hustle, right? Of the, of the maid. Then, while Majnoon, and a person who was in a state of insanity, while Mughma Ali, and a person who was unconscious. If you fell unconscious, you became 
um, insane or something and now you gained your sanity, right? Or you gained your consciousness, you fainted and now you're awake again. When they became conscious again, when they gained the sanity again, it is sunnah for you, that person to take a ghusl as well. Then, walil ikhram, for the person who's going into ikhram, for umrah, hajj, etc. or for both. Walidukhuli Makkata for Al Musharrafa and to enter the noble holy city of, of Makkah, it's also Sunnah to make a ghusl. Walil Wukuf before you go stand on Arafah, right? You're traveling, you're walking on the bus, you stop at one of the toilets, all the showers, and you jump in there, you take a ghusl, Sunnah ghusl before you enter the boundaries of, of Arafah. Um, Walid Tawaf before every time you go down for Tawaf, take a ghusl. And that's just ordinary Tawaf, we're not talking about Tawaf in the state of Ikhram. We're talking about any time you're going to go make tawaf. Right before, jump in the shower in the hotel before you go down. I'm just going to go make a tawaf, you know? Because the tawaf is also for the greeting of the masjid and so on. So, I'm going to take ghusl before I do that. Or sa'i, I'm going to do sa'i. So, meaning ghusl before your umrah. Wali dukhuli madinatin. And when you're entering the holy city of Medina also, then you can take a ghusl. Wabil mash'ar al-haram. And when you enter Mustalifa. Mash'ar al-haram is Mustalifa. When you're entering Mustalifa from Arafah, like I said, all the toilets have showers in, so there's thousands of showers all over the place. Before you get to the borders of Mustalifa, go in one of those toilets, take your ikhram off, jump in the shower quickly. Obviously, don't use soap at the center and so on, just use the water. You shower yourself down quickly with the niyat of ghusl, uh, sunnah ghusl of entering into this next um, uh, place that you need to enter onto. Put your towels back on or put your clothes back on if you're a lady. And then you proceed, and then another ghusl, another sunnah ghusl has been achieved. وَثَلَاثَةٌ And also the three days لِرَمِّ الْجِمَارِ For the pelting of the jamarat. Right? The 11th, 12th, and 13th, when we're going to pelt the jamarat of the hajj, right? Uh, which is called ayam tashriq right? The days of tashriq. Every day you can take a ghusl before you go up after midday, after zawal. You go up and now you go do your pelting. Before you do that, go quickly to the bathroom area, go and take a ghusl, and then you take a walk up onto the onto the, 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 the pelting area over there, onto the concrete structure there, and you can go and do your pelting, inshallah. These are some of the sunnah ghusls that a person can take um, at these various times, inshallah. May Allah give us tawfiq. Any questions? Any questions? No questions? Then we'll end on that. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil isati amma isifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Jazakumullahu khairan.